Uh, it is uh, an honor and a real pleasure for me to give this uh, 20th Schrodinger lecture. So the outline of the lecture is physics at the Terra scale, uh, energy, the Large Hadron Collider, the accelerator, and the experiment that Richard was just mentioning, and the physics prospects. So uh, since it's also a 100th anniversary of uh, Imperial College, I thought we could start actually 100 years ago. So what did physics look like at that time? And uh, uh, Rutherford was the first person who actually figured out what was inside, correctly figured out what's inside an atom. And he figured out that there was actually uh, a, a nucleus, a heavy nucleus, around which the electrons were whizzing. Now, what he did was uh, 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 use alpha particles from radioactive decay and striking a foil, a gold foil. And ex that is exactly what we do in particle accelerators as well. We uh, accelerate particles and bang them against each other or some material and see what comes out and try to understand nature from these interactions. Now, during the 100 years that have uh, uh, gone past, we've actually found two more layers. Uh, one, which is uh, the uh, structure inside the nucleus, actually has protons and neutrons. And inside the protons and neutrons, in around the 60s or 70s, we found that actually there are entities called quarks. Uh, so, for example, a proton is made out of two U quarks and a down quark, and that is what's shown there. Now, particle accelerators are the tools we have used to make this progress over the 100 years, and they're still being used, and that's what I'm going to describe to you today. And associated with these accelerators are powerful detectors which work on these high-energy particle accelerators. Now, the accelerators allow us to revisit the higher energies of our ancestral universe, uh, so we can observe phenomena and particles that are normally no longer visible in, or existing in our time. Now, the higher energies actually allow us to discover heavier particles, and probe conditions at high temperatures of the early universe. Now, there are two gentlemen down there. One is uh, uh, an equation equals mc squared from Einstein. So if you put a lot of energy, you can actually make heavy uh, objects. So that's the idea in a particle accelerator. You accelerate particles to very high energies to make heavy particles which don't exist uh, normally. The other thing is uh, the Boltzmann's relation, which is e equals kT. So higher the energy, the higher the effective temperatures, further back you go in time and looking at the uh, early moments of the Big Bang. So this is actually uh, embarking on a voyage of discovery, and that is what the LHC project is. So particle physicists, after a long period of preparation, some 15 years in fact, uh, both in the accelerator and the experiments, are about to embark on this voyage uh, and into terra incognito of the terra scale energy. Terra scale is uh, uh, an energy uh, which is uh, something like a thousand billion electron volts. An electron volt is the amount of energy that an electron picks up when it traverses a potential difference of one volt. So it's, and to get a better idea of what this is, it is the, the sort of conditions that existed one thousandth of a nanosecond after the Big Bang. So this digital camera that Richard was talking about is actually taking pictures, not of today, it's taking pictures of what was happening at that time in some of the interactions that were taking place at that time. This in order to gain a, a better understanding, a deeper understanding of what the universe is made of and how it works. And uh, the order behind what appears arbitrary in our current universe becomes clearer at higher energies. Now, looking a bit more detailed into the uh, work of last century, the first half of last century actually created the foundations of uh, modern physics, which is quantum mechanics, and Irving Schrodinger was one of the key players in that. And that is the theoretical framework for understanding the universe on the smallest scales, that is molecules, atoms, electrons, quarks, and perhaps further down. And Einstein's general theory of relativity, which is a theoretical framework for understanding the universe on the largest scales, stars, galaxies, and so on. They both have been actually confirmed to tremendous accuracy, but as currently formulated, they both cannot be right at the same time. Uh, so there's a problem here, a big problem, which will probably be resolved by going to unified theory, hopefully. Now, they are both simultaneously needed in extreme conditions inside black holes, the first moments of the Big Bang. In other words, tiny yet incredibly massive uh, uh, conditions, if you like. In the second half of last century, uh, uh, a tremendous, uh, a beautiful marriage between quantum mechanics and special relativity took place to deliver us quantum field theory, which has led to the standard model of particle physics. And that is perhaps the crowning, one of the crowning uh, achievements of 20th century science is the construction of this standard model of particle physics. So the standard model of particle physics, if you concentrate on the left-hand side of the top, is actually matter particles and the forces that govern their behavior. We only have three of the four forces. Gravity is missing here. Uh, and you have three generations of quarks, for example, and leptons. The first generation on the left-hand side is what is needed to construct what we are made of, 
and the other two generations appeared afterwards. And uh, one didn't know who ordered them. But if you want to understand uh, the difference between matter and antimatter, there is an asymmetry in the universe, you need at least three uh, generations. That is a, a necessary requirement, perhaps not a sufficient requirement. So there are some indications why we have three generations. And then you have the forces which actually in, uh, 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 they interact with. with. These forces are electromagnetism, uh, weak interaction, and the strong interaction. Electromagnetism, most of us are familiar with. It is uh, what uh, governs what happens in atoms, in electronics, for example. And weak interaction is the one that is uh, powering the sun. And uh, one of uh, our professors here, Abdul Salam, actually worked out a way uh, with some others how to actually unify electromagnetism and weak interaction, and we call it the electroweak interaction now. Now, what happens is that the, these forces are mediated by particles, which are on the right-hand side, the force particles. Uh, for example, electromagnetism by the photon, and the weak interaction by the W and Z bosons. Now, the strong interaction is the one that holds the quarks inside the, nuclear, inside the uh, proton or a neutron. So since it glues uh, protons and neutrons, Americans using very wild imagination have called them gluons. So that's the uh, mediator of the strong force. And so, as I said, uh, gravity is missing. Now, the standard model actually has been, uh, it's a beautiful theory. It contains the quantum theories of electromagnetism, quantum theory of weak interaction, which is uh, now electroweak interaction, and the quantum theory of strong interaction. Now, the, it has been actually tested in the previous generation, the LEPIC uh, accelerated great precision. So standard model makes predictions, and the LEP accelerator has measured them to one part in 10,000, and uh, tens of measurements of, uh, of uh, parameters. So why would you want to actually to go beyond if uh, this theory is so beautiful? Now, the standard model contains too many uh, apparently arbitrary features. The masses have to be put in hand by hand. The way they are actually coupled to each other is put in by hand, essentially, all from measurements in a sense. But we don't get a deeper understanding of why these numbers are what they are. And presumably, we'll, uh, this will become clear as we make progress towards unified theory. It also has a, a, a fundamental component which we do not understand. It's the generation of mass. And uh, one uh, mechanism that is favored and uh, uh, has a lot of uh, momentum behind it, if you like, is the Higgs mechanism. But there could be some other physics. Maybe there's another uh, layer which we haven't found yet. We'll find at the LHC, for example. But one thing is sure. The answer to this question must be found at the LHC energies. And deep down, the question is, Although electromagnetism and weak interaction have been unified, the mediator of uh, electromagnetism has a mass zero, whereas the mediator of the weak interaction has a mass 100 times the mass of the proton. How does this come about? The simplest theory is actually, we can write down, have masses uh, set to zero, essentially. They're elegant, but they're not describing nature. We are here. We have mass. Also, the standard model gives nonsense at higher energy. It's perfectly uh, valid at the 100 GeV energy scale, which was the LEP. When we go to the LHC energies, actually, it mathematically breaks down. It gives nonsensical answers in some of the reactions that we look at. And in fact, it turns out that the Higgs mechanism provides a solution to this as well. Again, it is indicating that the LHC energy, there is something special about it. And the standard model is logically incomplete. I mentioned the gravity is not in, in there. So we need a quantum theory of gravity to go to the unified theory. One of the candidates that people talk about is the superstring theory, which brings uh, with it some very dramatic concepts like supersymmetry or extra dimensions of space-time. So, and they could also be up, uh, at, at LHC energies that we might be able to see them. So as an experimentalist, our problem is actually to find new particles, find new symmetries, and find new forces. And further down, it is particles like the Higgs boson, the supersymmetric particles, uh, the uh, heavy brothers of the Z, extra space-time dimensions, and black holes, for example. So that is what we are looking for. Now, I'll spend a few minutes on uh, some of these uh, concepts. So what is mass? Now, to Newton, uh, mass was uh, in these two equations, for example. Our weight is proportional to our mass. But he also said it was inertia of bodies, that if you wanted to give us a given acceleration for a heavier body, body, you had to give it a bigger kick. To Einstein, it was e equals mc squared. So energy and mass were convertible currencies. So you can uh, generate energy from mass, which is what happens in an atomic bomb, or you can uh, generate mass from uh, energy, which is what we do in particle accelerators. Furthermore, he said mass actually curves space-time. Now, all of this is correct. But how do objects become massive? And the simplest theory, as I mentioned, was all particles are massless. And that does not describe nature. So what we do is we postulate 
that there's a field which pervades the universe, and the particles interacting uh, with this field acquire mass. The stronger the interaction, the higher the mass. This field is a quantum field. And as with every quantum field, there's a quantum associated with this, and that quantum is the Higgs boson. So if you were to find the Higgs boson, we would know that this field actually exists. And this is uh, what uh, uh, Professor Higgs has uh, actually elucidated. Now, the next question is, what is supersymmetry? I mentioned the symmetry. Now, if you look on the left-hand side of the top, that was the standard model. And it is actually separated into two parts. The left part is matter particles, on the right side, uh, side are the force particles. And in fact, there's a property which actually separates them. Uh, the left-hand side are, uh, carry a property called spin, which is half integral, and the right-hand side ones carry this property, which has an integral spin. But is there a difference? And probably there isn't a difference, and supersymmetry actually postulates no difference and predicts that for every matter particle, there is a superpartner, a force-like particle. So this would actually mean that an electron has a partner called the superelectron or selectron. So we have a doubling of all the particles. Now this is not unusual because uh, Dirac told us there were particles, and then he said they were actually associated antiparticles. So he doubled the number of particles in the 30s. Now where are these particles? We haven't found any. Uh, they have to be heavy because otherwise the accelerators would have produced them. And there's a fair amount of circumstantial evidence that they are waiting to be found at the LHC. And if they are found, they can, the lightest of this uh, species actually would be the particle that is responsible for the dark matter, which Richard was mentioning. Now, what about gravity? How do we bring gravity in? Now, gravity for people, uh, uh, physicists clearly, it's a force law which goes as one of R squared in three dimensions. But if you go to two dimensions, the force law changes. In fact, it uh, weakens more uh, gently, and the weakening goes as one over R rather than one over R squared. So you can clearly see that the number of dimensions actually modify the uh, laws of nature for electromagnetism and gravity, for example, or, uh, gravitational uh, attraction, for, if you like. And so this actually gives you a hint that extra dimensions do have an effect on the force laws. And if it, in fact, supersymmetry, uh, super uh, strings actually uh, live in 10 dimensions. We don't really see them because we believe they're curled up and our microscopes are not powerful enough to probe into this smaller space-time to see if there are extra dimensions. And the LSE accelerator might be able to actually peek in there and give characteristic signatures, which will then tell us that we actually may be living in more dimensions than uh, four. This would obviously radically alter uh, an, a view of uh, space-time. Now, Schrodinger actually made a prescient uh, comment there. What we observe as material bodies and forces are nothing but shapes and variations in the structure of space. So that space in those days was uh, four dimensions. In fact, at that time, uh, it was, uh, the, Kaluz and Klein actually raised the issue of uh, five dimensions. So it is not new as well. It was raised 70 years ago as well, that there might be a fifth dimension. And that had some consequences. Now, so summarizing this part, the physics of the Terra scale energies, what we do is we pro uh, uh, collide protons at unprecedented energies to create conditions that existed a fraction of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. And we're looking for particles like Higgs boson, supersymmetric particles. And we're trying to answer the questions like, where does mass come from? What constitutes dark matter? How many dimensions of space time are there? And can we make further progress uh, towards a unified theory? And that is actually what the CMS experiment and the LHC accelerator and the sister experiment of CMS, ATLAS, is uh, uh, going to do. And so now I'll describe that. So I'm going to the LHC project. So I'll start uh, by actually outlining where CERN is. CERN is uh, on the border of Switzerland and France, uh, on the outskirts of Geneva. So you can see Lake of Geneva uh, and the airport of Geneva on the right-hand side here. And this is a tunnel which is 27 kilometers in circumference and is 100 meters underground. Main site of CERN is here. There are Jura Mountains on this side. And, uh, and the CMS and ATLAS experiments, the ATLAS experiment is uh, actually on the main site, and CMS is diametrically opposite in the countryside. And there are two other experiments. One is LHCB, which actually specializes in uh, looking for or studying this uh, with the origin of uh, matter-antimatter asymmetry. And the ALICE experiment is actually uh, colliding lead uh, against lead at very high energies. And the energy density is so large that the protons and, uh, and the neutrons inside the nuclei actually melt away and you form a new form of matter called quark gluon plasma. This uh, state of matter must have existed in the early universe as well. And they will study that. So I will concentrate mostly on CMS. And the physics of ATLAS is very similar to the physics of CMS. Now, uh, let me say a few words about the machine. 
the machine is also a tour de force in its own right. And uh, uh, in, in the tunnel there, previously there was a LEP machine, and that has uh, all been taken apart. The tunnel was emptied out. Now it is full again with the, uh, uh, the new machine, and most of it uh, is made out of these magnets that I'm uh, showing you. The last magnet was uh, lowered uh, in April, and the last interconnection, meaning the machine has been closed, was done earlier this month, and it's been cooled down to 1.9 degrees Kelvin. So there are some challenges which had to be overcome. So this is another view of the tunnel. And to reach the required energy, we actually have to uh, operate these dipoles at 1.9 degrees, uh, which is uh, the temperature of superfluid helium. The temperature of outer space is 2.7 degrees. So the outer space is warmer than this ring. And in fact, the ring will has to have a, a vacuum which is better than the vacuum in the outer space. So again, superfluid helium is a very interesting engineering material, and Lynn Evans, uh, who is the head of this project, is in the audience here, and, uh, and he has actually been uh, also working with a, a large number of uh, engineers and, uh, and, and techs to build this machine. Now, to compare this machine with what exists, the energy is about 10 times bigger than what we have at the moment, and the luminosity, the number of interactions that take, take place for every second, is about 20 times bigger. But what is impressive and uh, awesome is the fact that the beam stores enormous amount of energy and it has to be carefully handled. If you lose the beam, actually it punches a hole through and it takes months to repair. So one of Lynn's job is to make sure, uh, and his crew's job is to make sure the beam never touches the beam pipes. So this is uh, the accelerator again. And to show you the sort of uh, audacity of these projects is a, a, a plot here which is stored energy on the vertical scale, it's a log scale and the beam momentum on the horizontal scale, again a log scale. And you see the LHC project, the dot sits right outside anything that has been done previously. And in fact, many, many of the plots which I can apply to either the detectors or the machine are, look like that. The jumps that are being made are at the levels of 10 times, 100 times, or 1,000 times. And they're not factors of two. And that's what makes this project interesting and challenging. And I think we will succeed, as I'll try to convince you. The, the LHC ring was closed, as I mentioned, and the first collisions are expected in the middle of next year. We should be taking in the data in the second half of next year. So what happens inside this accelerator? Uh, you have bunches of protons. In fact, there are 3,000 bunches of protons which go one direction in one way, and then another 3,000 go in the opposite direction, and they meet in, in the detectors. The detectors are like cylindrical onions. They're about four layers and each layer has a particular task, and all together they allow us to measure the energies and directions of all the particles that are produced in these collisions. So each bunch has about 100 billion protons, and they cross each other every 25 nanoseconds. 25 nanoseconds is the amount of time the light takes from, from me to people sitting in the front here. So the, uh, pr these bunches are actually following each other very, very closely, and we have to keep the uh, products of these collisions separate. Uh, from each other. So, in fact, what happens in an interesting event is actually it's not the protons that collide, it's the constituents of the protons that collide head-on. And these are the quarks and the gluons, for example. And there are a billion pairs of protons interacting every second. And the interesting events we're looking for, for example, the Higgs boson, occurs in one in 10,000 billion collisions. So it is, uh, finding a, a needle in a haystack is child's play compared to this thing. So what are the experiment challenges? I've given you some idea that the detectors will not be some things like which we have, built, ever, we have ever built before. They are radically different from the previous generations. And as I said, the bunches of protons uh, cross each other every 25 nanoseconds, and they lead to some constraints to the detectors which have to be addressed. The LHG detectors must have a fast response because every 25 nanoseconds, a new uh, set of interactions are taking place. In fact, in CMS detector, the wave of particles generated by one uh, crossing has not left the detector when a new wave starts inside, and you have to keep these waves separate, so they have to have a fast response. The detectors have to be highly granular. There are lots of particles produced, and you have to separate two particles which are close by, and that means that there are a very large number of channels. Richard mentioned 100 megapixels in a sense, so there are 100 million elements, which is a factor 10 larger than what was uh, previously seen. And the detectors must be radiation resistant because this billion pairs of protons interacting actually are leading to a very high radiation levels. And our detectors and electronics have to uh, sustain these uh, high rates. Uh, and this was not a problem that we had to face in the previous generation of experiments. So this is a CMS detector. 
uh, the detector is actually dominated by a, a, a very large high field solenoid here. And I'll show you some pictures later on. This is the biggest solenoid ever built. It has a, a magnetic field of four Tesla. This is 80,000 times the field of the Earth. And it contains these four layers. One is in purple, which is inner tracking made of silicon detectors. The green layer is made of uh, lead tungsten crystals. Blue layer is made of uh, uh, brass and scintillator. The uh, green and blue layers are called calorimeters. They allow us to measure the energies of particles that are produced. The purple layer allows us to measure the, the momentum of the particles as they bend in, inside this high magnetic field. The magnetic field is returned uh, through the iron yoke shown in yellow here, and interleaved there are, are detectors which actually detect muons. Uh, the muons are the only sort of particles that actually reach out there apart from neutrinos. So this is a cylindrical onion, if you like, and it uh, has two holes and the faces which allow the beam to come in and out, and the interactions take place in the middle of it. And to give you an idea, uh, the size of a person is uh, shown in the front here, and it has a weight of about 12,500 tons. It's about 15 meters in diameter, and it's about 20 meters in length. So the detector actually can be pulled apart, and this for the ease of, uh, of assembly of the detector and ease of maintenance. So I'll show you quite a few pictures of parts of the detector actually pulled out. So this detector, as shown in the main view graph, is actually detector closed. In fact, you can pull it out. And we have to close it when we want to uh, run uh, the magnet, because uh, otherwise the whole thing gets sucked in by a force of about 10,000 tons. So CMS collaboration is a very big collaboration. There are about 2,500 scientists from many countries, about 38 countries. And the biggest national group are uh, the US. And UK is sitting here, which is also a reasonably sizable contribution. Now, there is also a sociology of these experiments, and to build such detectors requires the talents and the resources of all of the thousands of scientists. And I've taken an example of the Imperial College group. So how actually can people, or groups of people, make an impact on these huge detectors? And we are one group out of 175, but we were founder members, and we've had a major input in the conception, design, construction, and the overall management of this uh, detector. In construction, we've uh, concentrated uh, on silicon tracking and radiation-hard electronics, led by Professor Hall and Sharp, and calorimetry. And then also, we're now preparing to exploit the physics. But I think uh, one point I wanted to uh, uh, give a bit of uh, uh, thanks here is, most importantly, it's the constant support and the backup over this long period from the home institutions at all levels. Uh, from Imperial, from the group leaders, uh, Peter, and the physics department heads, and the dean, and the rector. And in also, to fund this thing, we need uh, help from the funding agencies, uh, PPARC and uh, now SS STFC, for example. So this is the sociology, which I'm not going to touch again. So now I go into the uh, detector itself. So how does one actually detect particles? And the top is a, uh, a silicon microstrip detector, and uh, at the bottom is uh, lead tungsten scintillating crystals. To detect particles, you must transfer energy to the detecting medium, otherwise you don't see it. So the energy transferred to the atomic electrons causes them actually to be either ejected from the parent atom, which is ionization, and that's how the top detector works. So you, uh, it's a 300 micron thick layer of silicon, charged particle goes through it, it creates electron hole pairs, the electrons go to a, the positive electrode and a signal is picked up. And this detector has about a thousand uh, strips laid on them with a pitch of about 50 microns. So you can localize the particle to 15 microns. I'm going to show you pictures with the detectors of 15 meters, huge detectors. But what we're trying to do is to localize the particles in space to 15 microns. That's about a fifth the uh, thickness of one's hair. Now, the other thing that can happen is that the uh, atom is excited. So the electron goes into a higher orbit, and then when it de-excites, it emits a photon. And the photon is actually uh, picked up by a photo device. So what happens is in a high-energy electron or a photon uh, bangs into this, uh, this crystal, and generates a shower, and the amount of light that is generated is proportional to the energy that is deposited in this crystal, and that's how one measures the energy of the, uh, of the uh, incoming electron. Now, the construction of these LHC experiments, apart from the sociological aspects, has required pushing the limits of technologies, and these technologies have involved engineering, instrumentation, electronics, computing, networking, and distributed analysis, which is uh, the worldwide uh, computing grid, which I'll mention in a few minutes. They've actually meant uh, we've had to develop novel technologies, technologies that did not exist at the time. So we had to actually figure out the technologies that can survive in these harsh conditions. And for example, uh, an example is the lead tungsten electromagnetic crystal calorimeter. 
there the design goal, so you're always driven by the physics you want to do, and then you select the technology. The goal is to measure the energies of the photons from the decay of a Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is predicted to have mass which is very close to 100 GeV. And in that region, the surest way to find it in, in the LHC is to see, uh, look for it in its decay to two uh, photons. And so you need to actually measure the uh, energies of these photons precisely. And in fact, to precision of about 0.5%. And only scintillating crystals can allow such a precision. There are other things we have to do. Now, to give you an idea, the work that has been required to get to the point where the instrument can actually deliver this performance, the ideas uh, in the early 90s, there are a few uh, centimeter cubes of yellowish samples which are shown to us by some Russians. And from there, we had to go to something which is 10 cubic meters. And so the intensive period of R&D was required to improve the radiation hardness, to remove the yellowness, if you like, to look at the purity, look at the... Uh, a fraction of lead, tongue, lead, lead oxide, lead tungsten oxide, and then compensate for any defects because it's a crystal structure which has defects, and you have to compensate them, otherwise they do not emit light or the light gets absorbed. And you have to prototype to make bigger and bigger matrices and check that whether the performance you expect from these detectors actually is being delivered, so you use uh, uh, controlled test beams for that. And then you have to set up the mass manufacturer. And this mass manufacturer is, you start from a few centimeters cube samples, and we need 10 cubic meters. So in fact, we had to convert a Russian ex-military factory to peaceful uses, and they've been producing these crystals for 10 years for us now. And then you have to integrate the electronics, and then go back and check that the performance is there, and then installation and commissioning. And then uh, from next year, we'll start taking data. So you, you see that 15 years have gone now. So the crystal production, so one of our uh, uh, previous uh, research directors is also in the audience, and he went to a, a place called uh, uh, near, a place near Tula, uh, where actually he's observing a crystal being grown. In fact, at the end of the cycle, it takes three days to grow one crystal, and we need 75,000 of them. So, and the ovens actually operate at about uh, 1,200 degrees centigrade. So after you've grown it, then you have to cut it and uh, machine it to polish the faces, and then attach the photo detectors at the other end. And then you have to actually turn it into a precision instrument. And this is where you start by two by five matrices stored in carbon fiber structures. And this is a large number of structures. And then you have to make them into uh, baskets of 400 crystals and then into modules, super modules we call them, of 1,700 crystals. And at the back there, you have to stuff in the electronics, which is the next transparency. So you can see some of our uh, uh, postdocs actually working on the electronics at the back of this thing. And then you go to the test beams and say, have you reached the performance of 0.5% that we set as a goal about 10, 15 years ago? And indeed, you reach it. And there's some other engineering issues, like you have to hold this 100 tons of material to a temperature stability of 0.1 degrees, some local difficulties, which have been resolved. And this is the detector now. There are 60,000 crystals sitting in this cylinder. And this is about 10 times bigger than any previous uh, experiment that has used crystals. And it's all working at the moment. So the other thing you can look at is uh, so the radiation hard electronics. Again, there's a plot like this. This comes from Jeff Hall. You can see what, where CMS is sitting. So this is, again, a log scale. And you can see that uh, there was a transition in the early 90s when we went from discrete uh, circuits to custom uh, VLSI circuits. And the numbers have been increasing. And again, you can see there's a factor of 50 higher than the previous generation of experiments. I won't have time to actually describe this thing, but uh, uh, associated with these uh, detectors are complex electronics which have to sit on the detector, which store the data for about three microseconds, waiting for us to decide that it's an interesting event has occurred, and then extracting the data using optical links uh, and sending the data to another cavern, which is about 100 meters away, and then preparing the data for extraction by the data acquisition system. Now, this is, uh, that was one module that I showed you, and the detector actually has about 20,000 of such modules, and this shows you what happens when you start putting the modules. You also have to put the cables in. So this is actually, you can see a person sitting at the back, and the next transparency is what's going to fill in in the central part. And uh, the detector I was showing you, as used as an example, is one of these detectors, and there are four layers of this thing, and this is another RA from Imperial College at the background there. So how do we uh, select the interesting events? I mentioned that there are a billion pairs of protons which are interacting. And we only record, and we can only record, uh, data for about a few hundred of these. So all of the others have to reject it. 
with a very high efficiency, as I'll show you, the numbers of events that end up in plots which tell you you've discovered something are a handful. There are thousands or hundreds. So you have to have very high efficiency. And the first thing we do is to, this is a display. Most of the time, the protons actually have uh, glancing collisions and they send energy uh, down the beam pipe either way. So as if the, this part didn't exist and that part didn't exist. So this is not very interesting. What we want to look for is head-on collisions of the quarks, for example. And when that occurs, energy is sent at 90 degrees, transverse to the beam line. And when you see a high energy or a, a particle with high momentum, you said this is an interesting event. That is the one that is mimicking the conditions that we were talking about a thousandth of a, uh, a, a nanosecond after the Big Bang, if you like. So, so the collisions taking place at that time are the ones we're trying to mimic here. So once that is done, we had then have to send the data uh, to a farm which is sitting on the surface, that's 100 meters above ground, uh, through optical links. And that is the uh, data that is being sent up where it's 1,000, uh, 100,000 megabytes, 100 gigabytes a second of data is then transferred upstairs. And there is a bank of 2,000 processors which is actually looking at the events. And in the old days, we had a mainframe, and then we vector supercomputers, then we went to mini computers, and these are these are thousands and thousands of computers which will be actually analyzing and doing physics online. These are processes actually, which are the cutting edge processes that you buy in uh, supermarkets, in fact. So once that has happened, there is an amount of data which is about five petabytes. This huge amount of data which is then transferred uh, to the CERN main site, and there you start running the uh, uh, processing jobs. So you try to start reconstructing what has happened in these uh, uh, collisions or events or pictures, if you want, uh, which are these uh, pictures that uh, Richard was talking about. And from there, this data then has to be found out across the world because we have 2,000 scientists they're sitting in 38 countries. And within a few hours of data being taken underground, the data is actually at the desktop of some physicist in China, for example. And that requires us to set up a worldwide computing grid. So that is a, 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 a next successive step, if you like. The World Wide Web was invented at CERN so that physicists could share the data. This is another way of actually sharing the data in real time. And this is a plot of what is happening at one moment, for example, as the data is being found out from Geneva in various places, in Europe, in, uh, in Asia, in India, in the uh, US, for example. Now, let me sh tell you something about the engineering challenges now. So the experiment actually was uh, assembled on the surface. So this is a picture which is uh, taken about six years ago. And that is the main shaft here, which you see here. And in fact, there was also a problem there, just to give you an idea that things are, never go smoothly. There's a, a, a sheet of water at minus 40 meters. We knew that there was a sheet of water there, but the force we, we didn't actually know about. And the force was such that uh, normally you actually use brine to uh, freeze this, and then you bore through it. And in fact, the force was such that they just kept destroying this brine layer, and we had to inject liquid nitrogen. So create real permafrost for a couple of years to drill through, bore through it, and line it with concrete, and so on. And now the building was actually extended, and in fact, the experiment was lowered by actually having a gantry crane which goes on the outside of the building. You can see the size of the building is rather large by looking at the cars here. And there's another secondary shaft which actually services the second cabin, where a lot of electronics is kept, which is 100 meters underground. So the next one is uh, the surface building. So I said the experiment actually can be pulled apart and worked on and assembled. So this is the uh, situation about a year and a half ago on the surface building. So you can see actually the exploded view of the experiment. Actually, in reality, that's how it was. So you have these wheels which you see here. If I can uh, get my cursor going, these wheels here, for example. There's the solenoid magnet which has already been ready. And there's this uh, hadron calorimeter which is this uh, uh, beige thing here. And then right the way through there is the end caps which is the looking through the experiment. So this hole is about uh, 70 to 80 meters long. And, and another anecdote, this one. This is one of our calorimeters. So these are actually, these are some gentlemen uh, in Murmansk sitting in a, a mountain of uh, uh, casings of the decommissioned shells from the Russian Northern Fleet. They're made of brass. And this brass is going to end up as plates in CMS. So what happens is that they are melted down in a, a factory in St. Petersburg and prepared into raw uh, brass plates, which then are sent to uh, Minsk uh, in Belarusia, where they're machined. And then they're brought to CERN and mounted on the detector. So this is uh, just another sort of anecdote. In fact, there's an another anecdote, anecdote with the crystals. The crystals have taken about 12 years to grow. And the uh, economic conditions in Russia have changed dramatically over this time. 
In fact, in the early days, they would refuse to uh, deal with any, uh, with their local currency. They, so all the contracts were placed in, in dollars. And so we placed the last contract about five months ago. And so we gave them the choice whether they wanted to place the contract in uh, dollars, in euros, in Swiss francs. They chose rubles. So we placed the contract in rubles, and it was a 10 million franc contract. So you can see the, the economic conditions during this time in some countries have changed dramatically. So once the detector is assembled and tested upstairs, it has to be lowered. These big pieces that I'm showing you, these are uh, several thousand ton pieces, for example. And they have to be lowered down the shaft that I was showing you. And that's a gantry crane. And this is the lowering operation started. So the cavern was empty about a year ago. And you can see the cavern. It's a fisheye lens. Uh, uh, so you can see one of the big elements. It's this element here, which is being lowered. And one is already down there. And this is 100 meters underground. So I'll show you a few other pictures of the other elements going down. So there's one element going down, which is the same one here. So one is already down there. So you can see the top of the shaft. And that's about 100 meters above ground. And so, for example, each of these uh, big elements is a story which uh, involves about 10, 15 countries. So this object was made in China. The de detectors here were made in China, uh, also in China uh, to an American design. I've actually mentioned the brass, which was actually sitting in the black, uh, behind that black plate. Crystals are going to go in here, which is the, made in Russia. And the iron structure in which they're mounted actually is made in Japan. And the green structures are also, were made in the UK here. So this is one of the central elements which is a 2,500-ton piece, uh, which has all of these detectors already mounted. And these detectors actually are working, have been shown to work on the surface. They have detected cosmic rays, for example. So the point is that these detectors, as they've been mounted, they've also been thoroughly tested so that when we take things down, we don't have to pull them back up because it's very difficult. So this is a, one way to look at it is these detectors are working on a philosophy as if that you're sending into outer space and you can't access them. So that has to be the philosophy. Of course, we can access them, uh, but that's a way to look at it. Now here, I'm going to try something which gives you an, a feeling for what these caverns look like, and I hope it works. So this is actually a, a high-resolution picture. So this is the uh, picture taken in the underground cavern uh, about four or five months ago. And actually, you can see there are a few people here, and I can zoom in. Uh, and see, so th here is the uh, brass uh, hadron calorimeter. There's the coil here. These are the muon detectors. So you can look at this uh, like this. And I can also now go upwards and show you uh, where the shaft is. And this is where the, the, this element was uh, lowered gently. It takes about 10 hours to lower this uh, object here. So you can see this, uh, uh, this shaft, which actually has the ventilation ducts, obviously, in there. And there are other things that you might notice that there are these elements here. If, if fire were ever to break out, we have actually to fill the cavern, which is a huge cavern, uh, with foam in 10 minutes. And so you have these foam-producing elements. So safety is also a, quite a crucial issue, obviously. So let me go back to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, main talk again. I hope I find it. Uh, where is it now? Ah, OK, here. So, so now I'm going into making these experiments work. and. Uh, and giving you some idea that indeed these experiments do work and they will work. The first thing we had to do actually was to assemble the coil to uh, make the magnet and operate it at the, on the surface. To operate the magnet on the surface, we had to close the experiment. And this is actually the magnet after, just after finishing. And you can see the size of it. And this was assembled in the surface assembly building of, uh, of, of CMS. And this was in October 2004. And this was uh, uh, late in 2005. And again, one of these plots which shows where the, uh, so this shows the energy stored in this coil per unit cold mass. The cold mass in here is 250 tons. There's uh, 20,000 amps which are going uh, in the coil here, which generate this four Tesla field. And of course, for that kind of uh, uh, current, you have to go superconducting. So this is a superconducting solenoid, the biggest ever built. And you can see uh, the leaps here. So the amount of energy, stored energy per unit mass is very large, and the amount of stored energy in uh, general is very large. And so CMS coil sits way away from the other, uh, other coils and has been tested. And in fact, the energy is uh, so large that it can uh, melt 18 tons of gold if it's uh, released uh, in an uncontrolled fashion. And of course, we have to sometimes release this energy in a controlled fashion. And there's a bank of uh, uh, resistors, which is about 10 tons of stainless steel, which uh, the current gets dumped and it warms up by 300 degrees in about five minutes. So this is now the process of actually closing the experiment. The experiment actually is moved. Or these elements are moved on air pad systems here, which you can see there, heavy-duty air pads. And you just pull them. You inflate them, and you pull them. 
and it's a fairly simple operation in the end. So this is the experiment now being closed, if you see. And after closing it, we've actually made uh, almost all of the elements, 5% of each of the subdetectors, if you like, of the four layers, to make them work, to turn the electrons or the photons that I described, uh, which generate the signals, to the bytes that end up uh, on mag tape, magnetic tape, if you like. And this is one of the cosmic muons going through uh, the detector. So this gives us a fair amount of confidence that in indeed these experiments will work. Now we've gone downstairs uh, and we're actually starting to use uh, uh, detect cosmic rays downstairs awaiting beam uh, next year. So this commissioning work continues with the cosmic accelerator rather than with the terrestrial accelerator until the terrestrial accelerator is uh, uh, available. So the last few minutes, uh, last five minutes, I'm going to spend on the physics outlook. I think I probably can spend 10 minutes. Uh, now, I think I may have convinced you that the previous generations of accelerators have established that we really do understand physics at the energies of about 100 GeV. And if uh, there are any new particles, they will have to have masses above 2 to 300 GeV. Now, the LHC will study this magic TV region. I've given you some arguments why this particular energy scale is something very special. It's not like any other uh, energy scale. Now, so how would we look for the Higgs? So I give you two examples. One is uh, this decay mode that I mentioned, uh, Higgs going into two photons. So uh, the proton's actually going into the screen, and another beam of protons going the, uh, coming out of the uh, screen, and they interact in the middle. And they produce particles, but they actually produce a Higgs boson, which decays into two photons, which you see as uh, 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 the red lines that you see. In fact, they indicate the amount of energy that the photon is carrying. So you uh, form a quantity called the effective mass, and you plot that quantity. And in fact, two photons can come from many background processes as well. So there's a large background. And what you're looking for is a peak. And if you see some, such a peak, then you know that you've found the Higgs boson, for example. And the next one is another one where, in fact, the Higgs boson goes, goes into two Zs, which were the particles that gave the Nobel Prize to Carla Rubia only about 25 years ago. And they are now actually... Uh, are the decay products of the Higgs bosons, for example. They further decay into uh, muons. So you get four particles come in seen in the detector, and you make the same quantity that I mentioned, and this is what you'll see. Now, another point you'll see is uh, the numbers of events that we're talking about, this is orders of years of data taking, is orders of handful. So again, this uh, emphasizes the fact that uh, looking for a needle in a haystack is a child's play compared to what we have to do. I mentioned uh, looking for new symmetries like uh, supersymmetry. So this is a simulation of what would happen if you produced the superpartner of the gluon, which is called a gluino, at about one and a half TeV. So you can see a, a proton has interacted with another one, and two gluinos have been produced back to back. And one of them has actually decayed into what we call the lightest supersymmetric particle, which actually carried a lot of the energy. And that is a particle which would be a candidate for dark matter and actually escapes detection and goes out of the detector. And we don't see it. So you see an, uh, an imbalance of energy. For example, on the other side of this uh, top plot, you don't see anything. In fact, because uh, something has gone away, looked like a neutrino, could be uh, this supersymmetric, lightest supersymmetric particle. And so what you plot is another quantity called the missing transverse energy. And this is what you expect, and that's what the signal would look like. Now, this is, uh, I'm making it look very simple, but the shapes of these two things are the same. So there's a lot of hard work would be required before we can claim that we've seen something or made a discovery. This is another type of event where, in fact, of, uh, instead of gluino, gluino, you have the uh, superpartner of the quark which has been produced, which sometimes decays uh, in the cascade into two muons. And you plot this uh, same quantity, the effective mass of these two muons, and you can see the background is like this, and the signal is like this. This is something which we can do in the first year, for example. And this is clearly separated from the background here. So no discussion that you found something. Now, what about uh, extra dimensions? So there are two ways. There are many ways. I'm just going to show you two ways. One is to look for a, a Z-like boson. So these are very heavy objects, like a few TeV, a few thousand, a few... Uh, uh, 20, 30 times the mass of the Z boson, for example. And this will appear in the detector and the experiment uh, as in the left-hand side. We could also, uh, this is fairly speculative, this one, uh, to create many black holes inside the experiment. And they would actually give spectacular decays, and you wouldn't be able to miss them if they were to be produced. Probability is low. 
In fact, uh, these black holes uh, do not eat, uh, eat the Earth because uh, they decay straight away. In fact, in the upper atmosphere, if these black holes do exist, they would have been produced over the billions of years that uh, the Earth has been around in the upper atmosphere using the cosmic rays at high energies. So they would be producing at the rate of a few per, per second, and the sun would be thousands and thousands per second. So there's no danger there. Now, what I have been discussing with you are matter particles. Now, we have an embarrassment. The embarrassment is that when we actually, our astrophysics and cosmology friends tell us that the universe is closed, uh, that means it's neither going to expand forever, neither is going to uh, collapse on, each other, uh, on itself. And they also tell us that the amount of energy and matter in the universe is such that the matter that we are made of, the one that I've been talking about, is 5%. So 95% we know nothing about yet. And being particle physicists, we think they, if there is this matter, uh, if this uh, energy and uh, extra matter exists, they must have a particular origin. And that is what we would try to look for. So on, the on this uh, uh, photograph, you see a composite photograph. It's a photograph which is made up uh, of observations from X-ray uh, telescopes, optical telescopes, and gravitational lensing. And it's a collision of two ga galaxies. So two galaxies have collided, and normal matter interacts with each other, the matter that we are made of. And that then actually radiates. And so uh, that is uh, shown in pink, so it's color-coded. So the uh, telescopes tell us that is normal matter because it's, it's radiating. And there's dark matter which is uh, indicated in blue. We don't see it, so there are no stars there. But we actually can look at stars behind this dark matter. If this is a dark matter, it is very dense. So a star over there was sending the light through gravitational attraction. The light gets bent from both sides, and we observe it, and we see two stars. And this tells us that there's a lot of matter there, and we deduce its presence uh, from this gravitational lensing. And what you also observe is actually this dark matter has gone right the way through, has not interacted. And that's exactly the sort of matter this lightest supersymmetric particle would be. It doesn't interact very strongly because it actually escapes detection, as I said, from our experiment. So this actually is also circumstantial evidence. If this is the origin, there may be some solution uh, at the LHC. Now, these are the, uh, uh, the data that, uh, for example, the WMAP experiment has uh, taken, which also indicates that actually the dark matter is about 25 percent and dark energy is about 75 percent. Dark energy is something very interesting because it is, behaves like anti-gravity, actually tries to explode things rather than attract them. So last few transparencies, what are the connections with the work that we're trying to do? Now, can we truly know the composition of the universe? So what is the origin of dark energy? Is it a remnant of some elementary scalar field which is analogous to the Higgs field, in fact? What is the origin of dark matter? Is it some sort of weakly interacting massive particle? And it turns out that the mass scale of this uh, thermal relic dark matter particle coincides with the mass of the uh, supersymmetry, supersymmetric particle that I was discussing. And what is the origin of matter? It's thought to be linked to this small asymmetry between matter and antimatter, which might in turn be uh, through the proliferation of this particle types, which I indicated earlier. And what is the origin of the Big Bang, which is the ultimate question. So here I can give you some indi indication. So these are perhaps speculations. But if the Higgs were really found, it has actually a profound impact on other fields as well. It could also be that nature has not chosen that path. And our job as experimentalists is to make sure we get what nature tells us, not what our theorist friends tell us. So concluding now, so at the LHC, we're poised to tackle some of the profound questions in physics. How do particles acquire mass? Are particles of matter different from particles of forces? What is dark matter made of? What is the exact exp explanation of the matter-antimatter asymmetry? And make progress towards answering the biggest question, perhaps. Is physics unified? Can we get to the point where we actually can explain all physical phenomena that we observe here or in the universe through a single unified uh, theory, which was uh, Einstein's dream? So the LHC project actually was conceived and designed to attack these questions. And that was done 15 years ago. Everything from the accelerator, its cryogenic systems, its superconducting magnets, the experiments, their detectors, their electronics, their data handling, uh, selection of the uh, precious few events has to operate at unprecedented scales 
and complexity in an unprecedented environment. And their construction has actually required a long and painstaking effort on a global scale. And they will be unparalleled scientific instruments that are almost ready to operate now. So as I said, the experiments will speak. Only they reveal and confirm nature's inner secrets. Sometimes our theorist friends do get it right, and then we have to confirm that. And the data from these LHC uh, project, if you like, experiments could really change our perception of how nature operates at the most fundamental level, 100 years after Einstein altered our notions, going back the 100 years, which is the anniversary of Imperial. So I'll stop here. <laughs>